Good morning. My name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Last month, we wrapped up the final chapter of yearly church visits. And when I headed out for week one, I could not have guessed where things would lead by exploring all these different churches. One thing I certainly couldn't have predicted was a level of interest surrounding my personal Protestant perspective of visiting Latter-day Saint churches for the very first time. I walked out quite intrigued just at the amount and the level of enthusiasm, the level of love, the level of warmness surrounding Jesus Christ from those that followed the Book of Mormon. Well, during my visits, one of the most intriguing and curious visits I had was in Independence, Missouri, specifically the area around the temple lot. So if you don't know, in Latter-day Saint theology, Joseph Smith, the prophet, the seer, the revelator behind the Book of Mormon and the Church of Christ with the Mormonism movement, he had a revelation from God that pinpointed Independence, Missouri as the New Jerusalem, as Zion. And the thought was this was going to be part of God's plan. This was supposed to be a precursor to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was going to be this gathering place before they could get plans started because this was going to be a huge community. Those in the area with those Missouri neighbors, they basically expelled Latter-day Saints from the area, especially with the then governor of Missouri issuing an extermination order on all Mormons. Plans fell through, Joseph Smith was eventually martyred, tensions rose, and it created this rift among the Latter-day Saint movement where several branches broke off. It resulted in a succession crisis that just caused all this issue and all this mayhem. So the majority of Latter-day Saints, they, they joined up with Brigham Young, they headed out west to Utah to form the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think everybody knows about them. But there were some Latter-day Saints that stayed back in the Midwest and they tried to reorganize the church. Well, the tricky thing about this all is with the site that Joseph Smith dedicated, nothing came about it. It was just sitting there. One of his followers named Granville Hedrick, he came back in 1867 and purchased the plot of land where this temple was supposed to be built. So he established the Church of Christ. And this church has owned the temple lot area for over 150 years. And they tried to build the temple in the 30s, but the Great Depression put a stop to that. Well, after my initial visit to the temple lot area, I learned that there were many more different churches among the Latter-day Saint movement with the restoration in this area that I didn't know about. So a big part of me wanted to visit at some point and come back. Well, this past spring, I had a unique opportunity that presented itself. Uh, I got a phone call from Patrick McKay. He is highly admired among Latter-day Saints. Uh, he is the apostle, though he says it's just a title, of the Joint Conference of Restoration Branches. Patrick invited me to, to head out there. And the, the thing that I really appreciate about him is that he was engaging in fruitful dialogue among the different branches of the Restoration, as he likes to call it, the Constellations of Mormonism. Uh, Patrick McKay, along with Casey Griffiths, Casey is a highly respected BYU professor. He's also part of the YouTube channel Scripture Central. They teamed up to organize a Book of Mormon rally. And Patrick started to reach out to all his contacts among the various branches of the Restoration to speak. And he also invited Stephen Pinecker, my friend from Mormon Book Reviews. And my name got brought up with all the church visits that I've done. He invited both of us to provide an, an outsider evangelical perspective of the Book of Mormon. So even though I have radically different beliefs, uh, I really found this opportunity to be, uh, to be a blessing and a gift. Uh, so I accepted Patrick's invitation. I headed out last month to attend. This was a little bit of a different church visit because I'm so used to being in the congregation. For night two of this, I was actually up on stage uh, to give a brief talk, which was very different for me. So I'll share a brief glimpse of what it looked like inside, and I'll be back in a moment to provide a brief recap.
If you've watched other videos, you'll know sometimes I get pretty deep into symbolism. When I was making all my church visits, uh, one thing I often wondered about was the very first time the word church was used in the Bible. So the word church first appears in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus Christ himself is talking to Simon Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. So when you think of a rock, you think of it being very solid, very hard. It's not going to break. It's not going to crack. And one of the funny quirks about Jesus during his ministry is when he would talk with his apostles, he often would nickname them. So with Simon, he nicknamed him to be Peter, which meant rock. So when you hear, upon this rock I will build my church, for a very long time I often referred to that as Simon Peter being the rock, especially in Acts as Simon Peter's ministry kind of takes off. But with Jesus Christ, you know, when he would say things with all the metaphors and the richness of what he would use in the parables, it usually had much deeper meaning. So it got me thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe the rock that he's referring to is this blue rock that we're on right now with planet Earth. But then also, maybe the rock he was referring to was himself being the bedrock of the church. Because if you accept Jesus Christ into your life as the foundation, you become a member of Christ's church. So I thought about it, and maybe it's not just one of the three, maybe it's all three together. Because especially Simon Peter, because when you think about it, again, he was supposed to be this rock. Well, what happens? Jesus Christ predicts that Simon Peter, you're this rock, but you're going to crack. You're going to deny me. And sure enough, when Jesus is taken into custody, Simon Peter cracks. And when, he's cru and when Jesus is crucified, where is Simon Peter? He is broken. And what is going to happen with a broken rock? It's not going to be much good anymore. So when Jesus resurrects and continues his ministry, it's like you also see this transformation, this resurrection in the mindset of Simon Peter. And next thing you know, this guy who was supposed to be this lowly fisherman, uneducated, he was supposed to be out in a lake someplace catching some fish. Next thing you know, he is enabled by the Holy Spirit and becomes this amazing preacher standing up for the gospel and standing up for Jesus Christ and the truth. Well, all throughout the Old Testament, you often see God gives a commandment and man has a really great habit of messing everything up. So when it comes to the church, it is no surprise man is going to mess it all up. So obviously the great schism in 1054, you have that crack of the church between the Catholics and the Orthodox Church. Then in the 1500s, you have Martin Luther. And even though I'm Protestant, like I believe Martin Luther had to do what he had to do, like when there's a part of me that wonders when Martin Luther took out his hammer and he nailed the 95 theses on that Catholic church's door, if he also wasn't taking that hammer and cracking into the rock that was the church. Because ever since, you see so many cracks, so many divisions, so many fragments now that have continued and continued and continued to break. Even right now with the Southern Baptist Conference, they're having their breakup right now regarding women in ministry. You even have the United Methodist Church. They're having their issues over gay marriage. We just keep seeing more and more and more cracks in this rock. So what to do about it? Growing up Lutheran, I often heard, you know, what the church needs is that it was in need of reformation. Uh, I was at Asbury a few months ago, and the term I heard is the church was in need of resurrection. But then when I first was introduced to Latter-day Saint theology, the term restoration was the first time I ever heard of. You know, you have the, the rock that was the church and, you know, man screwed it up. We have all these cracks. Like with Joseph Smith, it was with the restoration. It's like, are you trying to heal this rock back together or is it a completely new rock? So this is just all kinds of things that I'm playing around in my head. This is just me brainstorming as I've been trying to dig into the symbolism of it all. To be a part of this Book of Mormon rally, this was very interesting to me because even with the Restoration, even though after Joseph Smith's 
murder in 1844, for 14 years, his Church of Christ went pretty well. Like, it was pretty together. And, like, the majority, even after his murder, you have the majority with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints moving to Utah. You have the smaller splinter groups. But after being a part of something like this, I saw just so much acceptance, so much unity for Jesus Christ through the Book of Mormon. I don't get that same sense from a Protestant perspective. I don't see a bunch of Protestant churches getting together and having like a holy Bible rally or anything like that. So I, I saw this and I was just like, hmm, what's going on here? The Book of Mormon rally was held last month at Good Shepherd Community of Christ Church in Kansas City, Missouri. It was just outside Independence where you see all these headquarters of different restoration branches. So the very first night, um, like usually with these church visits, I always go in incognito. Like I'm nobody special. Uh, I go there to worship first and uh, try to observe and kind of share my experiences with you as a viewer. This was a little bit different on a personal note because a lot of people knew who I was. Uh, so like I was with the reception, I was, I was very humbled by that. Uh, and, and it was, it was reassuring, you know, with, as I do this YouTube channel, that there are so many people out there, uh, that, that see positivity in this. For the first night, uh, it was a symposium. Uh, there were four speakers. It was led by Patrick McKay's brother, James. And two of the speakers were BYU professors. Also Josh Gailey from the Church of Jesus Christ. That's part of the William Bickerton group. And also Adam Stokes. He's a, an apostle and an elder of the Church of Jesus Christ with the Elijah message, the assured way of the Lord. So they gave presentations with a lot of components of academics, of apologetics, of a lot of research. So that went about three hours, and then the next morning I was invited to attend a round table of various restoration branches that would be held at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Stake Center, just across from the Temple Lot in Independence. And uh, like uh, it was the group, it was led by Casey Griffiths, and I really liked how he facilitated the meeting. So he started off by you know giving an introduction from everyone, and then the way that it started is he asked every branch to give a holy envy about other type of restoration churches. So what I really liked about that is with LDS, one of the holy envies was the missionary component and also the translations. Because with these smaller restoration splinter groups, there is no way they could translate the Book of Mormon to so many different languages. Then when it came to the Church of Jesus Christ, the William Bickerton group, uh, one of the holy envies was just that, that spirit-filled worship, especially with the Songs of Zion hymn books. So, and, and with uh, Adam Stokes, he was there as well, with the Church of Jesus Christ, with the Elijah message, the assured way of the Lord. It's a smaller splinter group, so a lot of questions were asked exactly, you know, what, what the church with that group does. So there was a lot of understanding, there was a lot of dialogue. I, I thought that was really fruitful type of discussions, and there was a lot of talk about Zion as well. And with myself and Steve Pinecker from Mormon Book Reviews, we were both in that meeting. Um, I, I understand we were probably the first Protestants to be a part of this. Um, like, like, there wasn't a whole lot that I participated in, um, other than just kind of some one-off conversations with people. But uh, I, I really, I think the biggest pink elephant in the room was just authority. Because with all these restoration branches, they have different types of uh, leadership organization. Especially with LDS, with the Modern Day Prophet, and everyone else kind of has their own apostles and elders. Some have a 70, some don't. Some have a quorum, some don't have a full quorum of 12 apostles. The highlight for me was definitely night two with the Book of Mormon rally. It was led by Patrick McKay, and it featured a ton of musical performances in a wide range of Latter-day Saint backgrounds of at least a dozen speakers. So there were BYU professors. There was a returning LDS missionary. Like, even at one point, uh, the entire congregation was filled with about 50 BYU students that suddenly kind of appeared towards the back. And uh, I, one, one gentleman that spoke was from the Church of Christ Temple lot. 
And he gave a speech talking about how he went into the Book of Mormon looking to criticize it, to try and find all the faults with it. But as he read more and more into it, and he saw the richness of Jesus Christ in that scripture, he was converted. He completely changed his life. Steve Pinecker also gave a fiery speech as well, uh, talking about uni unifying efforts with the restoration that he's had with Mormon book reviews. And I gave a brief speech as well. And for me, again, this was very different because I was actually up on stage the entire time. And one of the difficulties I had is I haven't read through the Book of Mormon. I didn't even know who Joseph Smith or the, what the Book of Mormon really was up until last year. So with my, my focus was more on the people. Because with all the restoration type of churches that I have visited, the Christ-like example at all of them uh, really impressed me. Because especially from my Protestant background, the, the, the holy frustration I have is I keep seeing more contention more combative type of efforts and it's like you know love god love your neighbor and i see that exemplified with latter-day saints because as i continued my 52 churches in 52 weeks i saw that type of behavior towards me it helped fine-tune myself so that i could be more of a blessing to other churches that i was visiting so that's what the book of mormon kind of showed me and it, like, otherwise, like from a Protestant perspective, like I would have been a long time ago, I'd be like, get this away from me. You can't add on to scripture. But then when I see the people, it's just so much more genuine and heartfelt. That really, it, one of the songs that was played was um, Changing Me, Changing You. Because with my speech, I didn't come prepared for it. I was just going to be like, all right, it's just going to come to me. And when I heard that song, it was so true to me because it was changing me. And I hope that with my videos, it helped change you when it comes to seeing some of these different churches and having a better understanding and maybe a better appreciation for them rather than the combative type of nature that we're so ingrained with nowadays. Uh, we wrapped up the weekend at Patrick's house on Sunday morning. Uh, he had invited me, Steve Pinecker, uh, the BYU professors, and also Church of Jesus Christ and the Temple Lot members. And it was just such an interesting home church atmosphere to be a part of. So Patrick McKay uh, led the service. And uh, like when he's speaking, there's just so much Jesus Christ resonating from him as he just preaches with so much passion from scripture. I just really appreciate who he is and what he represents and what he is all about with Jesus Christ. Um, afterwards we had lunch and then like I had to take off, but so many people were sharing their testimonies. And one of the th things I love about learning with Latter-day Saints is the testimonies. Like what is your relationship? What has Jesus Christ done in your life? And like, from, again, from my Protestant perspective, I'd love to hear more testimonies from people in their relationship with what Jesus Christ has done for them. I hear that so much in Latter-day Saint churches. I'm just so appreciative. Even before I left, um, I, I want to say she was the mother-in-law of Patrick. Uh, she was in her 90s. And like I met her the night before, and she was just so kind and sweet. But then she gave her testimony on that, that Sunday afternoon. And it was just... The, the amount of her relationship, just talking with so much joy, so much passion about her relationship with Jesus Christ throughout the years, throughout her 90 plus years on life, to hear her own testimony, um, I didn't want to leave. Like, it just resonated so much. And I, I was just so appreciative to be in that room to hear the richness of Jesus Christ in everybody's lives. I try to remind myself often that God's greatest commandment was to love God and to love others. And sometimes that can be frustrating in today's contentious environment, as many Christians will hurl out biblical passages like they're these scriptural grenades to try and blow up people's personal relationship with Jesus Christ that doesn't align with their own. And after this, and even with this video, like I often kind of wondered with the church, it's this rock that has split. But during my conversations and learning from Patrick, he had a much more optimistic approach to this, where he sees 
God planting seeds throughout all the different restoration churches that he's dialogued with. And like that really got me thinking because like the way that he sees it is the more that he has reached out, the more that he's seen miracles throughout all these different fields. So whereas maybe with one true church, you know, you're expecting the same type of fruit, he's seeing a variety of fruits develop from all these other different type of restoration churches. And as myself, as I look into this, like, like as I have learned much more in dialogue with Latter-day Saints myself, I'm, I'm finding there's so many more commonalities through Jesus Christ, whereas many others try and focus on all the differences. Are there differences? Oh yeah, there's a lot. But instead of putting the microscope on all the differences that there is, like we're not planting gardens together because with Zion, isn't it supposed to be this garden? You can't create the Garden of Eden with rocks. You need to plant it. You need to water it. You need to show sunshine and then let it wait. Let God's hand work through Father Time in the dirt, in the soil, to bring something rich, something fresh out of that garden. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is through love. So from anything I got out of this visit, it's plant seeds, plant love, because that's going to be the greatest way that we can all gather together, no matter if we're Latter-day Saint, Protestant, Catholic, whatever. If we're showing love to others, I think that's a pretty good head start. We're going to wrap it up on that. Hope you enjoyed this week's visit to the Book of Mormon Rally in Kansas City, Missouri. As always, feel free to like and subscribe. I'll have some other videos up here with other Latter-day Saint church visits. But until next time, hope you have a good one.